Well, good morning, everyone. It's good to be in God's house. It's always an honor and a privilege to turn to God's Word. Amen? And uh, I appreciate this opportunity to share God's Word this morning. You pray for me as I do so. We're going to continue, and uh, I'm going to be speaking on looking at being a good neighbor as a follower of Jesus Christ. Last week, Pastor Dave was here, and he gave us a simple, practical, and yet profound message that being a good neighbor and the steps we can take to being that kind of neighbor. Today, I'm going to be actually speaking from the same passage, only going further through it. I'm not preaching the same message, so you can relax. Uh, Hopefully, we're not going to just say the same thing. Amen? So if you turn with me in your pew Bible, it's 725 in the Scripture. We're going to be looking at Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through 37. We'll be walking down through that Scripture together this morning. uh, But I want to begin by bowing our heads for prayer and asking God to bless the message. Our Heavenly Father, we just come before you in Jesus' holy name. We thank you for your love for us and that you first loved us. And how that your challenge to us today and through this series is that we would be like Christ in the sense that we would not wait for our neighbor to love us, but we would love them first. And so, Heavenly Father... I pray that your Holy Spirit would just settle down over our hearts and our minds. Lord, I come in my weakness this morning asking that your Holy Spirit would make your strength perfect in my weakness as I share your holy word. And Lord, I just pray that our hearts would truly be challenged, that we would not just come in, hear a message, and go home and be the same. But Lord, we're asking your Holy Spirit to change us. I can't change anyone. Pastor Lynn can't change anyone. The church can't change anyone. We need your Holy Spirit to move and change us. And so, Lord, move on our hearts today, I pray. In Jesus' holy name, amen. Amen. As we look at the idea that Jesus is emphasizing on being a good neighbor We'll be looking at this passage of Scripture from a different perspective and some different emphasis. You see, the idea of being a good neighbor as Christians is not just another church promotion to try to grow the church. The idea of being a good neighbor is not another fad that's printed in a book and popular among the church population. The idea of being a good neighbor and really loving God and our neighbors ourselves has powerful implications this morning, communicated by Jesus Christ himself. And hopefully we'll set up and take notice of this familiar story in a new and a fresh way. As I reread the story, and I grew up in the church, I've been in the church since I was born, I've probably heard this story either taught or preached on a hundred times. But as I read the passage again, I began to ask the Holy Spirit to help me see this illustration Jesus gives in a new and fresh way. And I want to say this morning, I have. Amen? God has spoke to me in a fresh new way and a new challenge through this scripture. Sometimes growing up in Sunday school, we almost become deaf to the message because we've heard it so many times. We need to listen carefully to what Jesus says and does here in this first encounter with the expert of the law. Let me share verses 25 through 28. Again, Luke 10, 25 through 28. It said, On one occasion, an expert of the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, What must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? And the teacher answered, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. And listen to Jesus' response. You have answered Correctly, Jesus replied, 
do this and you will live. Here in this encounter, Jesus answers the most important question any person can ask. What must I do to inherit eternal life? If we've not asked this question, if we've not dealt with this question, I just want to say this morning, please ask this question for yourself. Respond to the gospel of Jesus Christ and all that he's done for us. So first, we need to realize the significance of Jesus' response to this ultimate question. Now, Christ was talking with the teacher of the law, so he's dealing with a very studied and intelligent religious individual. He's a teacher. So in Christ's way and wisdom, he does not answer the question, but he challenges this teacher of the law to answer his own question. And he does. So what was the answer? The teacher answered, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with your strength and your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. The teacher of the law did know the law well because he was quoting first Deuteronomy 6, 5, which says, love God. And then he responds from Leviticus 19, 18, love your neighbor. Now, I want you to listen very carefully this morning about what I'm about to say doctrinally. The only way for us to be saved is through the atonement of Jesus Christ made on the cross. Amen? There is no other atonement for sin. There is no other way. John 14, 6 says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. So we need to understand in the t there's a tension that you and I live in this morning. There is the tension between grace and Jesus paying the price, and he is the only atonement for our sin. But then, based on this passage of Scripture, there's the tension between what Christ has done for us and what we must do. Are you with me? Now, some will teach it's just just Jesus and what he did and it's not up to us to do anything but the reality is we live in this tension between what he has done and what we must do and Jesus responds to this question what must I do to be saved you see we must be in cooperation with Jesus in love so our faith that saves us in Jesus Christ alone, yet Jesus establishes here in the answering the most important question that we must be in cooperation with Jesus in love and a love for God and a love for our neighbor. We are involved in the equation of our salvation because we have to respond to what he's done on the cross. Amen? Now, don't misconstrue this. I'm not promoting a work salvation. But we have to respond in what we must do to be saved and have eternal life. And I say all that this morning to say, we cannot go over this passage of Scripture about being a good neighbor lightly. It is a serious matter as a follower of Jesus Christ, to fulfill his will. James says in 2.17, In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not a confident, excuse me, in the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. Now the last I knew, folks, if something's dead, it's not worth anything. I'll never forget when I was pastoring the church and, and the, the Parsons was right behind the church 
It was Sunday morning. I'd gone over to church, and my daughter had a hamster. Well, she had gone to church, and Elaine found the hamster dead. So she told my son, go get Elisa. We need to let her know her hamster died. And so they go get Elisa, bring her back, and you'd have to know my daughter. And she's not, I don't know, what, eight years old? And show her the, the hamster. Elaine is crying a little bit. She's upset and upset about what Elisa might think. And Elisa looks at the hamster and says, well, I guess it's, I can't sell it now. <laughs> if it's dead, it's not worth much, is it? First John 4.20 says, Whoever claims to love God yet hates his brother or sister is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother or sister whom they have seen, and I want to emphasize that word seen, cannot love God whom they have not seen. I thought of the story in Matthew chapter 25, starting with verse 34. If you remember, Jesus gives another illustration of the king, and it was the day of accounting. It was a day that they had to stand before him, give an account for themselves. And it says, Then the king will say to those on the right, Come you who are blessed of my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? Or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick in prison and visit you? And the king will reply, Truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these my brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. But then the reverse is true. Because he goes on to say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed into eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. And they will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or need clothes or sick in prison and did not help you? He will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Every person we encounter as followers of Jesus Christ out of a heart of love for Christ and our neighbor. And I want to emphasize it's out of love that Christ has put in us. We should see every person we encounter as we would Jesus Christ. Amen? Now, I don't like this kind of preaching, folks. <laughs> that means when I'm on the road and that guy cuts me off, I've got to think twice about how I respond. Or when I see a need, how I'll respond. And then John says it even a little stronger. Dear friends, let us love one another. For love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God. Because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. 
Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Do you hear what Jesus is establishing here? For our, fa our faith and our salvation to be real and complete, our faith has to be in unity with Christ and His purpose. And that is to love. Amen? So loving God with all we have and loving our neighbor as ourself is not an option, but a privilege and a reality that God makes, wants to make real in us and in the church. We want to be able to say in golden, as the world looks on, we want to hear them say, those people down at FBC, behold how they love one another and their neighbors well. But secondly, we need to understand and realize our responsibility to our neighbor. Let's look on down through chapter 10, verses 29 through 33. Now, I'm going to read this twice, not to be redundant, but to emphasize. He says, but he wanted to justify himself, speaking of the teacher of the law. So he asked Jesus, who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes. They beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. Let's set the stage of this illustration. Three men. One was a priest, one was a Levite, which is the priestly tribe of God in, in Israel. And the third was an unclean, unwanted by the church man, despised by the Jews, a Samaritan. But I don't want to focus so much this morning on the three men. But what I want to focus on is what they had in common. Let's read the scripture again. Is it up here on the screen? But he wanted to justify himself, so Jesus asked him, And who is my neighbor? In reply, he says, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. Then he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes. They beat him. They went away, leaving him half dead. And a priest happened to come down the same road. And when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. Listen carefully. What did they have in common? They all saw the man and the need. You see this three-letter word, S-A-W, all of a sudden becomes significant because all three were responsible because they saw. So the question begging to be asked here is, if they all saw, why did they not reach out to the man? Now, I can give you a lot of theological answers that are probably true. I mean, one of the reasons a priest may not want to have done it, had, had wanted to take the time to do it, is because he was headed uh, to the temple. He was the priest, and if he were to touch this man who were half dead, he would be unclean. He would be unfit to go into church. Maybe they were busy. Maybe they had an appointment. Maybe he was concerned about being contaminated. I could give a whole gamut of reasons of why sometimes we pass by those in need, even today. But here, I, I want to share what I believe is the real answer. Religion 
is not enough. Religion without love is sterile. It's dead. Regardless of our position of significance in the church, only religion that is born out of true love for God and a true love for others will respond to what it sees. Amen? Folks, I'm not taken away from what Pastor Dave said last week. If anything, I'm enforcing the truth he spoke to us. As Dave, Pastor Dave said last week, we see our neighbors. They're right in our block. But I would like to extend this idea of what a neighbor is in that it is anyone. It is anyone we see that has a true identifiable need and we have the opportunity and means to meet that need, whether it be physical or spiritual. The key is they saw. Now this man in need was not in the Samaritan's block where he lived, but he was in the vicinity of where he was. And he had a need in those who walked by were made responsible. And then thirdly, godly love does not see the inconvenience or cost as more valuable than the person and their need. While the two religious men actually avoided him by walking on the other side of the road, it was so impactful to me as I reread re -read this that for the Samaritan which he was on the road so he had an agenda he was going somewhere he had business to take care of but there was no hesitation or calculation in the Samaritan man who saw the person in his need he did what he was responsible in love to do As I thought about that, I seen Jesus entering into Jerusalem. He knew the cost. He knew the sacrifice he would have to make. But he did not hesitate or calculate what he had to do on the cross when he has seen us lying in the ditch of hopelessness beaten up by this world and stripped by the enemy and left half dead by sin. He did what was the responsible thing in love to do. Romans 5, 7-8 says, Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person. Though for a good person, some might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And we also see in this story that being neighborly out of a genuine love for God and others has no barriers. I find it interesting that the religious men had the barriers. The man who was not so religious was willing to cross barriers. Now that's not a downplay on the church, folks. That's not to knock Pastor Lynn because he's a priest in our church as a pastor. What it's saying is, is God wants us to step beyond our religion and step into the lives of people. It's not just about religion. It's about relationship. And loving our neighbor. I just want to say briefly. It's a hand up. Not just a hand out. Anybody can give a hand out. Not get involved. Amen. It's easy to write a check. Or drop a bill. Send a letter. But God's calling us to get involved. And, and I just want to say here 
Not everyone who presents themselves to us as Christians or as a church as having a need necessarily have a real need. So I just want to help us understand wisely to be good stewards of God's resources to help others. That we be prayerful and careful and discerning of the Holy Spirit. Because there are people in our culture, if we're realistic about it, that are looking for an advantage to use the church. But the key this morning is, is we as individuals, we can't do everything for everyone. We just need to be faithful to those that God brings us to see. Amen? And I want to say this morning, too, this is not driven by guilt. If you're feeling guilt this morning, just rebuke that in Jesus' name. This is not to be driven by guilt. What we're talking about here this morning is to be led by love. Amen? And just to remind us of what Pastor Dave said, God has us where we are for a reason. Elaine was in the latest Bible, ladies' Bible study a couple years ago, and I believe Connie Case brought up a prayer request of a lady who had two young girls, her husband had left her, and her daughter was wanting to go to prom, but she didn't have the finances uh, to get everything she needed. And so, as Connie shared this request, and they prayed for this family, and on top of that, this mother has a very rare disease that will, her whole body spasms and will eventually take her life. So Elaine was a good neighbor through other people, and she gave an amount of money to help this young girl to go to the prom. And so, weeks or months later, uh, the house across from us sold. And there was a lady and her two daughters that moved into it. And I went over and introduced myself. Met them. And then I noticed, because they had told us a little bit about how their daughters were, were in Western Airs and stuff. And in the back of their truck, they were unloading uh, cowgirl boots. Is that the right word? <laughs> and gear. And up to this time, now I realize that this lady had a disease. And so guess who moved in next door to us in our neighborhood? That same family that Connie Case had mentioned in prayer. That Elaine had been a neighbor through a gift. And now they literally became our neighbor next door. And God has given us many beautiful opportunities and still does to minister to them. I just want to conclude by saying as elders with Pastor Lynn, it's our desire to see people saved out of their hopelessness and brought into the church to find healing and wholeness just as the man in this story did. Because we know if you finish the story that the Samaritan made sure he got the care he needed. He made sure that all the expenses were paid and that the man was whole again. And as elders and as a pastor and leaders of your church, we can strategize. We can create all kinds of programs to try to accomplish this. But as I was looking at this story and this illustration of Christ, I was reminded. The truth is, there is nothing that will be as successful and impacting on our community and for our church than for all of us to be good neighbors. So we see the responsibility in the future is in all of our hands. Amen? What happens in this church, what happens in the future for the next generation 
is in all of our hands. As we go out into our world, as you college students go into your college, as you workers go into your business, as we go into the, the supermarkets and, and the different places of our community, and as we're on our way somewhere and we see the person with a need, and we are obedient and willing to love them and to minister to them and to build a relationship with them by being a good neighbor. I don't believe this is a church transforming, life changing passage of scripture because I preached it this morning or because Dave preached it last week or Pastor Lynn will be preaching it in the weeks ahead. I believe it can be changing because Jesus taught it. Amen? And it's a significant message for us today. I want to remind you, the lie that you can't make a difference is straight out of hell. You can, I can, we are. And I want to emphasize we are making a difference. So this is not to demean us as if we're not doing enough. This is just to remind us and challenge us to pay attention to what we see. Amen? And be willing to let God use us and trust Him with it. Our Heavenly Father, I praise Your holy name for Your love and Your truth. Thank You that You love us so much. And Lord, I just thank You that when You looked down and saw us, You did not walk by on the other side of convenience. But you paid the price. You gave yourself. You bled and died. And you rose again. So that we could be made whole and restored and live. Lord, help us to pass it on. And as you said in this illustration, go and do the same. Amen.